What is the science of love in terms of healing as well? It's a healing force, right? So again, compassion. So, so firstly, you do not necessarily need love from a partner. And mm-hmm. it's important that you learn to generate self-love. Yes. If you do not generate self-love, if you're not able to generate love from within, going into a type of relationship can be difficult because you develop neediness. And I've been there, right? Mm-hmm. We've, we've all been there at points where we lack self-love. We need it from our partner and that can push away the partner. 100%. It makes you unattractive. Yes. So in phase one, compassion, we activate love as an energy by seeing the face of someone you love. And even if you are single, that face could be a nephew, a niece, a mom, a dad, a pet, your best friend, maybe a younger version of you. You feel that love in your heart, you give it a color, and then you take a deep breath. And as you exhale, you imagine that love filling your entire body. You can even experience love from God or a higher power. You feel that raining down upon you and filling your entire body. And you just feel that love for yourself. Then you expand that into wider and wider circles. Mm-hmm. So love as an energy is a incredibly powerful energy because yes. the feeling of love creates all of these other delicious emotions. Esther Hicks, the spiritual teacher, wrote a book called The Deliberate Power of Emotions. And she says, you know, it's not our minds that attract. She also wrote the book Law of Attraction, but she's very clear. It is the emotional state you're in that causes the attraction. It's not, oh, I'm gonna see that house, so I'm gonna get that house. I'm gonna see myself healing, so I'm gonna get that healing. It's the emotional state you're in. This is why when I designed the, the sixth phase, before you go to the manifesting part, you work on compassion, gratitude, forgiveness. This is about six minutes. You put yourself in the right emotional states, then you go to the action-oriented manifesting. Mm-hmm. Because you're, you want to attract and manifest from a, a, an, a, an emotional state that has all these yeah. other things. Gratitude, yeah. love, appreciation, all these different things. Yeah. Because it's hard to attract from a negative space. Right. Emotional negative space, right? So, okay, here's a, here's a, I guess, controversial question for you. Narcissism has been, you know, a massive topic in the last couple of years. What is the difference between self-love and narcissism? Narcissism is self-love without love for others. Mm. We need both. This is why in the sixth phase, we literally start with compassion as a trampoline Mm -hmm. to everything else. You expand your love and you feel your love radiating to all life, all plant life, all animal life, all human beings, and we go into wider and wider circles. So if you were meditating here, you would see your love radiate to your entire team and even every pot of plant in your office. Then you'd expand it to the entire city of LA. You might then go on a detour, maybe see your partner, see your mom and dad, see a nephew and a niece, see your pet. Then you might expand it further to all of the United States because especially in this country, we need to bridge the gap between people of different Mm -hmm. political views. So you want to see all people of the United States, regardless of color, religion, political view, as being a recipient of your love. Then you expand it to the entire world because you want to feel yourself connected to the greater human species. And studies show that not only does this make you kinder and gentler, people literally start tipping more, you know, but you get less triggered. And so there's a huge beneficial effect to you as well. When you walk the world, like your mind sees the beauty in other human beings. Even if they happen to wrong you, you see the beauty in them. Your judgment disappears and it makes you a better person, but it also makes you a person who uplifts the people around you. Mm. What happens when we judge others? Well, there's a natural thing in our mind called the fundamental attribution error, right? So what happens? The what? It's called fundamental attribution error. So when we make a mistake, we attribute it to circumstance. But when somebody else makes a mistake, we attribute it to character. Compassion practices tune down FAE. So let me tell you something that happened to me that I'm not proud of. So I remember I was living in San Francisco and I'm walking down the street and you know, I, I, I love this particular street. I walked on beautiful Victorian houses, really nice spot. And there's this lady in front of me and she's eating a freaking Oreo. And as she puts the Oreo in her mouth, she drops the Oreo wrapper on the mm. ground. So I'm like, how dare she does this? <laughs> right. What a horrible human being. Mm-hmm. My fundamental attribution goes up. I'm Straight talking, to judgment. I'm thinking she's horrible, she's a litter bug. So I walk up, I grab that Oreo, I go to a bin, I make sure I'm walking faster so I overtake her and I drop it in the bin and turn around and kind of give her a judgy look. And she looks at me, she stops dead in a trap. And then she starts crying. And I'm like, "Um, why are you crying? 
I'm just picking up your trash. And she goes, why do you have to be so mean? And I'm like, I'm not trying to be mean. Why do you have to litter? And she goes, listen, I'm so sorry I littered. I found out this morning that my boyfriend dumped me. Oh, man. And all I wanted to do was just ease that pain with this Oreo. And my mind was mm. on so many different things. I didn't realize I dropped the wrapper. Why do you have to be such a jerk to me at this moment? And I felt like she was right. I mm. was a jerk. I labeled her a litterbug without understanding what was really happening in her soul. Mm. She wasn't a litterbug. She was a sweet woman who went through a hard time and made a mistake. And I felt bad. Wow. That's fundamental attribution error. All of us do that. Right. We all do that. Now, when you are seeing the world through the lens of compassion and emanating that compassion, if the wrapper dropped, you might pick it up still. You might drop it. But you don't feel like you need to prove the other person wrong. And you wouldn't judge the other person. You know that in human life, all of us go through moments of weakness, go through moments of yes. pain. And your default thinking might more likely be, hmm, I wonder if she's okay. Yeah, I think a lot of us jump to the conclusion of, oh, if you're not, if this person's not being perfect and they 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 falter a little bit, we we quickly jump to a exactly. conclusion and we judge, right? As opposed to jump to compassion. Yes, we should jump to compassion, not conclusions exactly. and judgment. And I and when you go with, I wonder if she's okay. Here's what else is happening. Firstly, you're not putting on more hurt onto someone who is hurt, but you are also feeling better. You don't feel like. There are bad people in the world or litterbugs in the world or bad drivers in the world. You just go, oh, I wonder if they're okay. And, and a natural human response is, I wonder what I can do to help. Right. And so imagine if we did this with, if we, we, we were school teachers and we did this with a student who was going through a difficult time. Not that person is misbehaving, but I wonder if they're okay. If we did this with our coworkers, if they were having a grumpy day, we just wonder if they're okay. Yeah. Maybe they had a fight with their spouse that morning. Maybe they had, they couldn't sleep the previous night. And so we approach the world from a different presence and the world becomes so much better, mm -hmm. but it also makes our world safer. So why do you think it's so hard for people to actually love themselves? Why, why is it such a hard switch to start appreciating ourselves, acknowledging ourselves for the hard work, having gratitude for ourselves, for how we show up, for the things we've overcome in our lives, for the adversities we've had to tackle? Why is it so challenging for so many people? I think one of the reasons is because culturally, as a society, the way parents have been trained to raise kids, the way our education system has been trained, trained us is to tell us that there are certain things we do which are wrong and we have to be right. We see this in religion. There are religions that said, you can't do that. That is wrong. God is going to judge you. You are wrong. A lot of this is nonsense. Look at what's happening in Iran right now, right? Mm. Women are being told that they are sinners for showing a little bit of hair. They're being arrested by morality Crazy. police, right? And that's why the women of Iran are taking off their hijabs and protesting right now. But it's not just in Iran. Think about like the religions in the countries you are at. Think about what you've heard in many, through many religious teachers. Religion is a beautiful part. And in phase six, we actually honor religion through prayer. But there's also that dark side of religion dogma, which tells us that there are right ways and there are wrong ways. And because you make that mistake, you are a sinner and you are going to hell and you know, all of these other things. Then you look at the education system. We grade kids based on the stupidest mm. things, right? You get an F for history and it makes you feel like a failure. But what the is that knowledge of history going to mean to your life in the future right. or geography, right? Nobody right, wakes right. up as an adult depressed because they can't remember, you know, the, the date of the Mongol siege of Baghdad or the amount <laughs> of rainfall in Montana. Right. We go through horrible situations in life because of heartache, because of anxiety, because of, you know, dealing with stress. We don't learn any of that. So we are graded on given grades as children told, this person is an A, you got an F, you got to study harder for the stupidest things which have no bearing in future success. And then there's parenting, yeah. parenting. <laughs> and so many parents practice discipline and they tell the kids, you need to do that. You need to do that. You're, you're bad because of this. You don't eat your vegetables, so you are gonna be frail. Mm. All of us go through that stuff. If you could go back uh, 15 years ago before your first child, what advice would you give yourself before your first child that you know now as a parent yeah. from all the things you so, did well and the things that maybe you so wish you would change. here's the answer to that. Here's the answer to that. It is, it, it's, it's two parts, yes. okay? Two parts. 
The first part comes from the psychologist Shelley Lefko. She founded the Lefko Method, which is a belief system training. And one of the things Shelley explained to me is that the most important thing a parent can do for their child is to protect the child's beliefs. As make sure your child understand that they can heal their body, that their beliefs heal their body. Ensure your child understands that gratitude and appreciation will actually cause more good things to come to their life. Make their child understand that getting an F is meaningless. Make your child understand that compassion is mm. an important quality. All of that, right? Protect the child's belief. Never install in your child a bad belief. So let me give you an example. I was driving uh, with my son once. It was a Sunday. It was Father Sunday. Um, and as we were, were, were driving, my CFO calls me. It's uh -huh. something urgent. He needed to talk to me. So I had to pick up the phone and talk to my CFO for 20 minutes in the middle of a Sunday drive with my kid. When I put down the phone, I realized that if I didn't explain to Hayden what happened, he might form a belief. Dad's work is more important to me. Mm -hmm. And that belief could emerge as adulthood. Work should come before family. All of these are dangerous beliefs. So I turned to Hayden and I said, Hayden, I want you to know you are the most important thing in my life. You, as my son, I love you so much. You're more important to me than my work. My entire company can disappear and I'd be okay. But you, I always love you and always want you around. I'm sorry I had to take that call for 20 minutes. Something important happened and my company needed me. However, we're going to extend this trip by another 20 minutes so we can continue spending time together because you fill me with so much joy. Mm. Do you see what happened there? Yeah. It's because in any circumstance, I ask myself, what will this tell my children about the world? Kids have a meaning-making machine. Mm. They rapidly create meaning. Right. right? Even so, if, you, if you don't tell them, they're yeah. going to make sense of it somehow. Exactly. So that's the first one. The second thing is, let your children know you love them. Like, it's so important. Like, mm -hmm. they must feel love from you. If they feel love from you, they're more likely to give love to themselves. Yes. But so often as parents, we don't do that. It's so hard, especially for men. So many men are not trained to say, I love you. I practice. Like, I know my dad loves me. He why, does is it, why is it so hard, it's though? It's weird, right? I know my dad loves me. He does the most incredible acts of service, right? Like, when I'm traveling, he'll ensure that my apartment, everything is running great. But he doesn't say, I love you. And so in my case, I tell that to my son. And it makes him a little bit uncomfortable. You know, guys get uncomfortable. My son is 15, but I'm, I tell him, Hayden, I love you. Um, when I missed his birthday because I was in this book tour and I left him a beautiful three-minute message just talking about how much I loved him, explaining why I felt I, I, I had to do this book tour, explaining that he is the most important thing in, 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 in my life along with his sister and re-emphasizing, I love you. And children need to hear that. Yeah. Protect your kids' beliefs and ensure that they know without a doubt that you love them. When you see the face of someone you love and you being loved to them, we know that there's a physiological difference in your body. In your body, but what in, about in, their okay, body? So, let, so first, let, let's talk about the science for your body, uh -huh. right? So what I just described, this idea of seeing the face of someone you love and being loved to them is actually how you kick off the six-phase meditation, which mm -hmm. is the protocol I designed. Mm -hmm. 